This is the first Tuesday of the month Wapaka City Council meeting. I call the uh, regular City Council meeting to order. Today is Wednesday, April 3rd, 2019, and it is 6 p.m. And let's begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we'll ask uh, Sandy to read the open meeting statement for us. This meeting and all, all meetings of the Common Council are open to the public. Proper notice has been posted and given to the media in accordance with Wisconsin state statute, so the citizens may be aware of the time, place, and agenda of this meeting. And also take <coughs> roll for us, Sandy. Brian Smith. Here. Steve Hackett. Here. Lori Chestnut. Here. Paul Hagen. Here. Alan Keeland. Here. Scott Prochatsky. Here. Dave Peterson. Here. Paul Mayo. Here. Chuck Whitman. Here. Mary Fair. Here. And Eric Olson. Here. Ten present, we have a quorum. Consent agenda. This is the agenda where we just take one motion and vote on that one motion, unless you would like to see any of those items uh, that are on the consent agenda moved to the regular agenda. Anybody like to see anything moved? If not, uh, motion to, uh, we need a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Uh, Hackett uh, Prochatsky to approve the consent agenda as printed. Discussion, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Against, motion carried. Uh, regular agenda, Sandy, you had something there? Yeah, and addendum number one was emailed and also uploaded to the city website on March 29th, adding unfinished business letter B, the second reading of ordinance number 0119. Thank you, and Henry, you just <clears throat> handed something out to Yes, it's a uh, information uh, for the strategic planning uh, part of the agenda, which is uh, later in the meeting. All right. Thank you. So those two items uh, we need to add to our packet, uh, and we'd be looking for a motion to approve the uh, regular agenda. So moved. Uh, motion by Keelan. Second. Second by uh, Chestnut that we approve the regular agenda as with those two additions. Discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Against? Motion carried. Under announcements and correspondence, uh, we have a presentation by the Wapaka Library, uh, their 2018 report, and I know Holly's here, but Peg, do you want to introduce her? And <coughs> Um, I have with me Holly Olson. She's the president of our library board, and this is her second year as president. Um, we're very pleased to and, um, report to you our annual report. She has some statistics and some photographs that are going to help you understand what we do. Thanks. Hi, thank you for having me here. Uh, so time flies, this is actually my third year and the third time I've been in front of the council. So thanks for having me. Um, Lori also serves on our board and does a wonderful job as a representative. So each year our um, library sends an annual report to the Department of Instruction and this is the 2018 annual report. Um, statistics are collected by the library and they're also collected by OWLS, which is the Outta Gaming Wapaka Library System. So you can see on this first slide, this is our mission, our vision, and our values, and they provide a framework for the ways in which we meet our community needs. As our society changes at an unprecedented rate, our guiding principles are purposely brought to allow for adaptation as we see the need. So as we become a community resource that promotes innovation, technology, collaboration, and all forms of literacy. So let's talk about last year. In 2018, we had over 9,000 registered borrowers. The city of Wapaka has about 6,000 people and over half of them have library cards. The non-resident borrowers are mainly from the four towns that surround the city, as well as people from Portage and Washera counties. 
The library is regularly open seven days a week for a total of 57 hours. In 2018, we ha added an extra hour to the Saturdays, meaning we are open for seven days a week at 9 a.m. The average daily visits is over 450 people, and the average daily checkout is about 4,000 items per week. So that's over 775 items per day. So these are the residents that check out items from our library, and the city of Wapaka is the, is the group that checks out the most at about 38%. Equal to that is the townships that surround us with about the same percentage. While the population of the city is about 6,000, our larger service area is close to 18,000 people. That service area can be looked at as the area that's served by our school district. Wapaka County and Washera counties reimburse the city for the use of the public library um, by their residents, and Portage County, which annu annually makes up about 9% of our total circulation. Um, current laws do not require Portage County to reimburse our library, um, and we are actually in the process of starting to hold some meetings with some advocates from Portage County that use our library to make some progress on that funding for the next year. So one unique feature of OWLS is the sharing of materials. The people in our community are big borrowers and enjoy the convenience of being able to get materials that are delivered right to our library here through OWLS. Our library also provides corresponding number of items to our neighboring libraries, and about 22% of our items that are checked out travel to other libraries in our system. So these are our checkouts by um, age range, and over one third of our items are checked out for teens and children. One of the library's goals is to advance liter literacy at these early stages by both providing funding um, progr programs for individuals and families. So you can see this is a new chart that we've included this year because um, we look at the renewals. Um, and so we're a convenience-driven society, and we have a, have a real shift in the way that patrons interact with our library. In 2008, renewals made up only 5% of our circulation, but this past year, almost one-fourth of our checkouts can be attributed to renewals. So we have many convenient ways a patron can renew, including over the phone, over the internet, and with text message. So one, ty one type of um, service that we provide is ebooks and e-audio downloads. And this past year, we saw an um, increased number of these downloadable content. Um, Overdrive started to offer simpler interface with the library, and our patrons took advantage. So you can see this unique graph here. That's, that number is um, uh, just in 2011 to 2018. And just from last year, we had over 6,000 more e-books e and e-audio books that were downloaded. So last summer, when the library parking lot was being reconstructed, we saw a decrease in visits. It was just too hard for families to get here. And the circulation of physical items. The circulation of physical items decreased by over 12,000 items, at, but our increase um, was over 6,000 items. So this chart tracks the percentage of difference from year to year. So we've seen a dramatic increase in downloads and a corresponding number of decrease in the circulation of physical items. But on a happy note, we just figured out that we're on track for a little bit better than where we were last year. So we're hoping that we are reached our bottom. So you can see this is not a new phenomenon. This chart illustrates the decline of circulation of physical items over the past 10 years. It's also true that when the economy is bad, people turn to the libraries for information and entertainment. Um, but when the economy thrives, the services um, are used less by the community. So the decline in circulation is not something just at our library. You can see all some of the local um, public libraries and some of the percentages that they're down. So working with these libraries and OWLs, we're, we're thinking about new ways that we can increase these circulations. So we can look to many factors relating to this decrease, digital downloads of movies and music and audiobooks, and a lot of nonfiction books and magazines have been replaced by videos that are on the in, in, internet. 
So as our circulation Circulation has shifted to downloadable books. The audiovisual materials budget has adjusted to this change. So one thing that our library prom promotes and provides for patrons is the internet. This chart demonstrates that the use of the internet on computers that are provided by the library and patrons <coughs> connecting to our free Wi-Fi. In 2018, we switched from computer stations used to Wi-Fi being used at a greater rate. The cost of devices have come down. According to the Pew Research, the, a vast majority, 95% people of people now own a cell phone. The share of Americans that own a smartphone is up 40% over the last 10 years. So whether it's looking for employment, in, obtaining forms for their taxes, or using online services, our computers allow access that many individuals and families cannot afford or are unable to access at their location or homes. In 2018, OWLS worked with the TEACH program to up, upgrade our library's bandwidth from 20 megabits to 50 megabits. Um, TEACH provides the cost for data lines for schools and libraries. Other devices such as robots used for coding games use the Wi-Fi too. So the, while the library provides materials and access, it's ultimately a service organization. We have approximately 15 full-time equivalents, including a building maintenance and cleaning staff. We provide ourselves with a high level of customer service that we're able to provide. Our staff help community members find the right resources, whether for entertainment or educational purposes. We select, order, receive, and process new materials. There were over 5,000 new items that were added to the library last year. Our, our library staff is highly trained to use technology that allows them to help patrons. Other operating expenses, including build, building expenses, were about $100,000. So you can see that this is how our library is funded. Um, the city is in, oh, wait, hang on. The city is in blue and okay. the county funding is in orange. And you can see that those numbers have changed throughout the years. So while we think of the library services as free, they really aren't. The city and county tax dollars support library wages, programs, materials, and services. Wapaka County residents pay for library services through their county tax bill. Washera County residents use our library, and Washera County is billed for that use. However, the current city dollars budgeted for the library is less than it was budgeted for in the last five years. The income other than taxes is derived from copies, overdue fees, grants, and donations. We are fortunate to have two nonprofit organizations that support our efforts. A big thanks to the Wapaka Library Foundation and the Friends of the Library and all those community members who give us their donations. So we're not just about materials and stuff. Programs are held for all ages. Children's programming Programming, literacy, and learning opportunities are the focus for the children's department. We assist adult patrons with lifelong learning. Drop-in drop programs allow for greater flexibility. There's always something fun and educational going on at the library. Besides the materials we offer, our library provides a space for people to gather, find common interests, and learn something new. An adult programs committee was formed with staff and community members to find new programming opportunities and enhance our current offerings. A new computer class was added and is now held on Wednesday mornings at the Senior Citizen Center. With capital funds from the city and the library foundation, our space has changed over the last few years and we've given the library a whole new look. Uh, we invite children and families to have fun at the library while gaining early literacy and coding literacy skills. Um, we have a new teen librarian this year, Taylor Wilcox, and she's brought many new ideas and programs to, to, the, to the teen room. She has started a book club, provides interactive gaming opportunities, and makes suggestions on what the kids should read next. She has been invited into the schools for many book, book talks. So last year, our theme for the summer reading program was Libraries Rock, and we strive to make the library an interactive place. We can start conversations with our whiteboards, engage people in playing games, and encourage reading and learning at every age. 
So the last entry in the annual report includes a statement from the library board addressing the support from OWLS. The funding for OWLS is provided through state taxes and is the only state tax for public libraries. OWLS continues to provide support for continuing education, technology, electronic resources, county funding, and youth services. In 2018, OWLS assisted in surveying the library patrons who reside in Portage County and will be bringing Portage County residents together to talk more about funding from that county. So looking ahead for the future, here are some of the goals for 2019. The mission, vision, and values are guiding principles for the important work that we do. In 2019, we'll, we will be embarking on a new planning process with a goal to better meet the needs of our community. So thank you for listening to the annual report. And now um, Peg and I are here and Lori for any questions that you have about the library. Great, uh, council. Any um, questions? There you go. Holly, I do have a sure. question, at, or and or Peg. Um, the library hours, um, I, specifically I'm thinking about like Monday nights for Winchester. Um, has there been some discussion about that in the past? I'm not aware if there has been, of um, allowing the library to stay open or having a staff person to stay so that the uh, people from Winchester wouldn't have to be out at at eight o'clock, starting at 6.30, it's sometimes pretty difficult to have a, a good question and answer period um, at Winchester. So I've heard quite a few comments from okay. people about that. Sure. Um, so thanks, we really wanna support that program because it does bring a lot of people to the library and it has so much good information and such a great educational program, but it looks like Peg might speak a little bit more about this. Okay. Well, um, we do have people that need to leave. They're they're eight hours a day, and their day eight hours a day are up at at eight o'clock. It's difficult to have somebody stay after. It does cost the library additional money to have somebody stay after and and make sure the building gets closed. Um, it's certainly something we can talk about. Thank you. I, I guess I was thinking that I know that we well I don't know this for sure. Does do groups pay to use the library space? Um, nonprofit organizations are not required to use the library space. Winchester gives a donation to the library for the use of the space, but they're not charged. Okay. okay. So, I mean, if that's something that we could consider, um, do you have other groups that use spaces for meetings and such? We do have lots of other groups right. that use our space, and we do have a meeting policy that asks that they're out and finished by 8 o'clock, and I know that's a difficult schedule starting at 6.30. We've tried to work with Winchester to make it easier for them, right. um, but you know, when you have 100 people at a meeting and you're trying to wrap it up, it is difficult sometimes to get right. the building closed. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, Holly. Thank you for. Thanks, everybody. I just. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I, thanks for the Thank presentation, you. and also thanks for everything the library does. It's used in so many ways, and I just want to thank the staff and everybody for making it wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie and Holly. I want to especially thank you. I mean, you are volunteering your time to be on this board, and we appreciate uh, what you're doing to for that uh, for the library too. So, thanks. All right, uh, let's move on. Uh, next on the uh, agenda is a proclamation for National Poetry Month 2019. Uh, we do have a proclamation, to, uh, and Mary Fair is the one that asked to have this put on here. Mary, do you want me to read it? or Please. Okay. All right. <clears throat> it's a good thing it's not a poem, though. Whereas, whereas the Academy of American Poets established the month of April as National Poetry Month in 1996, and whereas the National Poetry Month seeks to highlight the extraordinary legacy and ongoing achievement of American poets, introduce Americans to the pleasures and benefits of reading poetry, bring poets and poetry to the public in immediate and innovative ways, make poetry an important part of our children's education. And whereas, as National Poetry Month, under the leadership and direction of the Academy of American Poets, 
is now the largest literary celebration in the world, and whereas poetry enhances and enriches the lives of all Americans, and whereas po poetry as an essential part of the arts and humanities affects every aspect of life in America today, including education, the economy, and community pride and development. And whereas poetry has produced some of the nation's leading creative artists and has inspired other artists in fields such as music, theater, film, dance, and the visual arts. And now, therefore, I, Brian Smith, Mayor of City of Opaca, do hereby proclaim April 1st through April 30th as National Poetry Month. I call upon public officials, educators, librarians, and all of the people of the city of Opaca to observe this month to celebrate the cultural riches our community has to offer and to recognize the important role of poetry in creating and sustaining, sustaining the great nation with appropriate ceremonies, activities, and programs. In witness thereof, I hereunto set my hand to the third day of April on uh, 2019. All right. Any comments, Barry, that you want to add? Well, I would add um, there's quite a few brochures that are out in the community about what's going on for Poetry Month. There's quite a few things. Um, this is uh, something that the Wolfpack Community Arts Board started last year, and so this is our second year of, of recognizing the month. Um, and we have worked in conjunction with the library. So there's many things going on this month. Um, I think a highlight is the, I don't know if you all remember the Cranky where we had the longest poem ever a couple of years ago. That's in the library again. There's manual typewriters. Um, just a short but cute little story is there's a, a young kid. We know his first name. We don't have any idea. We don't. The library probably does, but they won't tell us who he is which is good, they shouldn't. Um, but he came to the library and he wrote, he's like 11 years old, and he wrote some of the most awesome poems on the manual typewriter, and uh, he, he's just great. Um, so, you know, if you hit one or two kids, it's, it's, it's pretty special. Um, we also have at 22 Lakes Brewery, we have a poetry reading. We have eight poets from the area that are gonna be doing some poetry reading. Um, uh, Poetry in a Smoky Less Bar is what we're calling it, um, kind of a beatnik type of um, beatnik poet sort of thing. So that should be fun, and that's on the 24th of April at 7 p.m., so everybody's welcome to come to that. So when you just, if you see a brochure, check it out. There's a lot of fun things going on. All right. All right, let's uh, move on to uh, public input. Uh, this is a time for... Uh, public input on non-agenda items. If there's anybody in the audience or uh, staff or council members that would like to speak to us on uh, non-agenda item, uh, just please give your name and address and limit your discussion to three minutes or less. I know, Laurie, you I have know. me out of time. I know. So go ahead. Okay, so um, City of Wapaka, great job because the voters that came in were 34.5%, which I think is just an awesome, awesome number for us. So thank you for coming out and thanking Sandy and all of her staff because when you go in to vote there, you're most certainly welcome and it's just a friendly atmosphere and very helpful. So thank you for, that's all, you know, a lot of them are volunteering their time. So thank you to you and your staff. Thanks, Lori. Any other public input? All right, uh, let's move on to uh, unfinished business. We have an ordinance. Uh, 0219, this is an ordinance creating chapter 8.11 of the municipal code, and it has to do with driveway permits, and this is our second reading. Uh, Justin, if you want to just uh, recap that for us, and then if you had any comments from the uh, public, I'd appreciate hearing those. Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the ordinance that is in draft form right now uh, is on page 59 through 61 of the packet. Uh, and this is second reading, so upon approval tonight, it will become an official ordinance. This is for driveway permitting. So uh, anytime somebody works within our right-of-way, we would like to know about it, and we would permit 
or allow them to do that work, whether it's a resident or a private contractor. So that's why it's a, a permit process. Uh, it's a zero dollar permit, uh, just because we do not want to add any additional cost to an already expensive or homeowner's expense of, of building a driveway. Um, but what we would ask them to do is uh, to let us know what they're doing, when they're doing, uh, so we, they can follow our standards uh, since they'll be working within our roadway and we're just protecting our own uh, infrastructure. Um, there is the permit itself uh, will be posted online. It will be available at City Hall. We'll advertise that this is a, a requirement moving forward. Uh, so even though it is a zero dollar, uh, there is a, a penalty or a fee that if they do not get the permit uh, and get basically caught doing the work within our right of way, uh, they may be subject to those fees. Um, <clears throat> we like to work with people, but we will do that advertisement and have that ready. Um, I think that pretty much sums it up. The standards of what we're looking for are worded in the ordinance. Uh, we will have a sheet available, um, basically a, a one page uh, standard sheet where it's drawings that show the dimensions of, of what things should be and look like. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Any questions for Justin? Again, this is the second reading, so by uh, how we do it in the city, of course, on the second reading, then we look for approval of that if, if you're okay with that. So I'd entertain a motion to approve. I move to approve ordinance number 02-19. Second. Motion by Keela and second by Peterson that we approve uh, or adopt ordinance number 0219, an ordinance creating chapter 8.11 of the municipal code as it deals with driveway permits. Discussion? Sandy will call the roll. Dave Peterson. Aye. Eric Olson. Aye. Scott Prochatsky. Aye. Chuck Whitman. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. Steve Hackett. Aye. Mary Fair. Aye. Lori Chestnut. Aye. Paul Hagen. Aye. And Alan Keeland. Aye. Ten ayes. Motion carried. All right. Thank you, Justin. Uh, next up, we have ordinance number. This is your addendum, by the way, that you received uh, and, and was downloaded separately in your packet. Uh, so we have ordinance number 0119, and this has to do with amending our district map. And this is also the second reading. Brennan? Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. Yes, this is just a follow-up action for a rezone request that I started a couple years ago as the um, property owner did sell some property last year and transferred some land um, and reconfigured some of the lots. We wanted to clean up the zone in on the property. The ordinance that's in front of you does require two readings, and this is the second reading for this evening. All right, uh, any questions? But he understands where this is. Uh, we'd be looking for a motion to approve this ordinance. Motion to approve. Second. A motion by Whitman, second by Hackett, that uh, we adopt ordinance number 0119, an ordinance amending section 17.201, parent 2 of chapter 17 of the municipal code of the city of Wapaka, entitled Amendments to District Maps. And this is the second reading. Discussion? Sandy, call the roll. Scott Burchatsky. Aye. Lori Chestnut. Aye. Steve Hackett. Aye. Eric Olson. Aye. Alan Keeland. Aye. Mary Fair. Aye. Paul Hagen. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. Chuck Whitman. Aye. And Dave Peterson. Aye. Ten ayes. Motion carried. Brennan, thank you. Yep. Uh, next up, we have uh, license report number 1443, and uh, actually it's being recommended that we deny this, so I'm going to turn it over to Chief Hosell. Thank you, Mayor. Um, when we get requests for bartender checks that, that I do, there's a flow chart, a bartender's license approval guidelines that's been set place, and in doing the background check on this person, Amber Horst, there was um, a number of alcohol incidents that were involved in following the guidelines. It would be my recommendation that it wouldn't be renewed or it up, um, given. Okay, and you could see, Council, in your packet that uh, the letter was sent to Amber. I don't think, is Amber here? I don't think so. Um, 
and uh, she was allowed to come to the council meeting tonight if she so chose, and she decided uh, obviously not to come tonight. So I, I, I would agree with uh, the chief's recommendation that we do deny this uh, this uh, license report. So we need a motion. So move to deny. Motion by Hagen. Second. Second by Hackett that we deny uh, license report 1443, which has to do with Amber Horse applying for a bartender's license. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Thank you, Chief. Uh, next up, we have uh, a property damage claim, and Kathy, you're on board here. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council Members. Um, my item uh, is in regards to a claim the city received for damages to a vehicle um, by the driver driving over a pothole on Fulton Street. Uh, it's a recommendation of the, our insurance company to formally deny the claim. Uh, this will shorten the statute of limitations in which the claimant can uh, take us to court uh, for damages to six months. So um, we're looking for uh, damage to a tire of about $500. And since we did not um, have any prior knowledge of the pothole condition on the road, um, we are um, not at fault for the damage. Okay, and this is the recommendation of our insurance Correct. company? Okay, any questions? Anybody want to make a motion? I'll move to deny. Second. Uh, motion by mail, second by Hagen, that we uh, uh, disallow the uh, property damage claim from jo Joseph Trendle in the amount of $494.25. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Thank you, Kathy. Doesn't mean we're not going to fix those potholes, though, does it, Justin? They've been fixed. Okay. They have? <laughs> <laughs> All of them? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, let's, uh, we have a request uh, from pick and save to modify their class A liquor license. Uh, it looks like they want to do uh, uh, have a pickup area so that uh, people can uh, they can have it delivered out to their vehicles for them. Henry, you want to explain sure. that a little better? Thank you, Thank you Mayor. Uh, Mayor and Council, this uh, request starts on page 68 of your packet. Uh, we did ask it a representative of pick and save uh, uh, please come uh, to the meeting, and I believe, uh, is, is this Tammy? Uh, no. Okay. Okay. Um, would you like to come to the come to the podium? Oh, please state your name. Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Brianna Cotton. I'm the assistant real estate manager for Roundies. Okay. Well, uh, they have asked to, to be able to expand their premise uh, uh, description to implement a new customer program. Uh, this is the first time we've seen this in our office, so we did run it by uh, our contacts and Department of Revenue. Uh, ref we referred that information um, uh, to a representative, and they did include it in the request. So I guess I would say that every uh, uh, check that we needed to see did get addressed in this letter. Would you like to go in a little more detail? Yeah, of course. What you'd like to do? So um, what we're implementing is our online ordering option, which is called Pickup. Um, so basically that's where customers can go online, pick out their groceries, and then come to the store to pick them up. So um, with this, there's designated parking spots in the parking lot that have um, signs that say pick up parking and call this number um, once you get there. So customers come park in the parking spots and call the number, and then an associate comes out to bring them their groceries. 
So when the order includes alcohol, what happens is the order comes in through the online system and then an associate who's over the age of 18 goes and picks the order from the shelf. Um, when, then it gets staged in the click or pickup area in the store um, and marked with a marker that says this order has alcohol in it. When the customer comes to the store and call, calls the phone number um, and says, I'm here to pick up my groceries. A associate who is um, has an operator's license comes, brings the groceries out to the parking lot, checks the ID of the person that is picking up the groceries and verifying that they are of age to pick up or call. And once that's done, loads the groceries into the car. Um, the um, transaction does not take place until after that ID is taken. Um, the money is not uh, transferred prior to that, and so that um, follows all state laws and everything like that. So um, I can answer any questions you guys have. Um, we've been implementing this across the state of Wisconsin, so for the last about year and a half, I've been traveling around to different cities and uh, making the same speech to all of you. So let me know if you have any questions. Anybody have any questions, comments? Is Alan? there a fee for that? The fee is four ninety five. Four ninety five. Four ninety five. Yep. The first three, I believe, are free. So try it out. It's super convenient. I use it. <laughs> I, I have a question about the age. I guess I thought the age was twenty one for uh, alcoholic beverages. Yeah. So to just pick the order, um, you the associate has to be above the age of 18. In order to be the associate that um, takes the groceries out to the car, because uh, transactions that include alcohol have to happen under the supervision of an operator. Um, and because this is in the parking lot, the transaction needs to be handled by an operator. So that associate has an actual bartender's or operator's license. It okay, is. I just see a, a potential for abuse here. The person who is 18 years old picking the alcohol off for a friend of his who is also underage. So what? So it gets staged in the um, area until somebody comes to pick it up. And then it's not an, just an 18 year old who brings it out to the So that to person has to be 21 or older to deliver it to the person who ordered it? Uh, that person has to have a bartender's license in order to take it out to the car. Okay. I, as much as you, uh, Alan, the, the state law does allow uh, individuals of 18 age or older to, to, have, a bartender, be, to have a bartender's license. I understand that. Yeah. The, the person, so I just see a potential the person for abuse, receiving it has to be 21. Yeah, and the person receiving like the groceries the has to yeah. be 21. Yeah. The person delivering is fine. You can be at a bar and be a bartender at 18. The person who's drinking in the bar has to be 21. I understand. Same. Okay. I understand. I got a question for the chief. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think of this plan, Chief Hotel? You're on the spot. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, like even out in the county, I think when he went through Cheesy Bob's, he had that side through delivery that was there um, that you could pick up. You know, um, as long as the guidelines are being followed, I, I guess I don't see any issues with it. You know, obviously, um, you've done this in other communities, and mm -hmm. have there been problems? We haven't had any problems in the communities that we've um, implemented the alt call. And we're doing it slowly, too, and verifying that, you know, the training is all in place and, every, you know, all the required people have the operator's license. So we've been, um, we've turned on alt call as part of the offering in, um, like, the Appleton area, um, in, I believe in Fond du Lac, um, we're about to turn it on. So, yeah, we've, we're doing it very methodically. And the other thing is, is we do uh, um, license checks on establishments that are selling alcohol. So the officers do go in there and they verify that the people that are behind the bar that do have their um, bartender's license. So we do checks at all establishments that do sell alcohol. And we would be doing the same thing at Pick and Save. We would be doing those same checks. 
and if there would be any violations, then we would follow appropriately. Okay. Eric? Well, if somebody goes to buy liquor, uh, is it a law that they have to show an ID? I'm just wondering if the person delivering out to the car, do they have to ask for a, to see a license? Yes, uh, they, they do. Uh, and that is not only the law, but it's also company policy that no matter the age of the person, you're getting your ID checked. So if you're 21, you're getting your ID checked. If you're 80, you're getting your ID checked. So. Okay. Paul, go ahead. Yeah, you know, one of the things over the years in going back a ways is <clears throat> the city council has held that you don't have liquor inside an establishment. If you go to it, such as Holiday Gas Station or Pick and Save, they all have to have separate em entrances. And we've done that over the years for the purposes of, of uh, keep it, keeping and monitoring people who are buying alcohol. So this, is, this would be a departure from what we have done in the past of separating uh, sales of alcohol into separate areas. If you go in any, any gas station, you will, of, you will see that we do not have <coughs> liquor intermixed with the rest of the building business. And this, and this would be, I would think, something that would do that. So we would be going, <coughs> departing from what we've done in the past. Uh, to help me understand what his comments are and question is, where is your staging area within the store? Um, it di it differs between um, each of the stores. So in this one, um, honestly, I don't have the fixture plan in front of me. Um, but usually what it is is it's a um, – it requires – um, some shelving, it requires a cooler and a freezer, obviously, to keep your frozen things frozen, your cool things cool. Um, and it's often in the front end, um, kind of separated a little bit, but it's often um, still sort of um, open, but in kind of a corner, basically. Sure. sure. So you're, Paul, you're more talking about when somebody orders the, the alcohol, the beer, the alcohol, it's going to be put in a staging area that's outside of the outside of the liquor store. You know, we've always, all of our other establishments like this, we've had separate entrance and a, so that the police can see clearly coming and going who is buying liquor. Again, um, BP, um, Quick Trip, Holiday gas station, they're all that way that they have a separate entrance for alcohol sales. And just uh, so you are aware, what we do as well is there's an order summary form. And so not only do we check the ID, but we actually take down the um, <laughs> phone or the uh, birth date of the person who's picking it up. And so then we keep that in our records for 30 days. Um, so that way you can, it can go back and be audited basically. Okay. Um, all right. Any other comments? I got to believe some of this is already happening anyways. If you ask, uh, somebody in the store to deliver, help you deliver your groceries to the, your car, they certainly help you. So it's already occurring anyways, but Brennan, did you have a comment? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I, I, I would hope that you would take into consideration if this does pass, mm -hmm. um, Mr. Hagan's comments, because I, I echo the same. I mean, I don't think you really want alcohol <coughs> sitting out where anybody could walk by and grab and it. grab it. Sure. Yeah. No, we could, um, in the staging area, we could stage the alcohol in kind of a separate location within that staging area to kind of make it clear. Sure. If that would be helpful. Sure. Thank you. I have just one one more question. And could you um, secure that staging area? Is it in the? I'm wondering, trying to think back. Is it in the front of the store where that where that bump out is at the end of the cash registers? To tell you the truth, I I don't know the okay. exact location at this store. I don't think it's been built yet. Um. So uh, I and I don't have the plans in front of me. I. 
basically we're, we've been keeping it open um, to keep, we like people to be able to, you know, see the click list area, but I think that we could definitely um, block, like contain the alcohol in the liquor portion of the orders. Um, that, I don't think that that would be a huge problem. Okay. Mayor, I do have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Is that area that you're going to be storing those items, is that going to have surveillance cameras that are there? There's surveillance throughout the store, yeah. Well, I mean, specifically, because if we could put a, if you could put a surveillance mm -hmm. camera in one part of the store, all you do is you get a wide scan versus if you put it in that particular area, if somebody were to go in there and take anything, mm -hmm. we'd be able to identify who those people would be. And I think that's after uh, Alderman Hagen's comments, my, I would be concerned that if it's not in the liquor department that somebody that could have access to it and could walk and grab it and it'd be my concern that somebody obviously would steal it or somebody that's underage would get a hold of it. Sure. Um, I think because we often have many cameras throughout our store, we could make sure that there's one that covers the click list area. Okay. <coughs> Comments. Uh, so, uh, what Picket Safe then is asking to expand their liquor license um, area. So, uh, we would need a motion if you are okay with that. Uh, would anybody like to make that motion? Move to approve. Second. Motion by Mayo, second by Keelan to uh, modify the premise description for pick and save to include the exterior parking stalls specifically designated for the online merchandise order and pickup services service and the pathway utilized to access the parking stalls. Any discussion, any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Against? No. Oh. Can you raise your hand? I'm sorry to pick you out, but we have three no's, so we have, Laurie, are you? Yep. You're a no? Oh, no. Okay, so we have four no's. Yep. Let's do a roll call just to Let's make sure. All right, we're gonna do a roll call vote. Paul Mayo. Aye. Alan Keeland. Aye. Eric Olson. I'm gonna say no. Steve Hackett. No. Dave Peterson. Aye. Paul Hagen? No. Mary Fair? Aye. Chuck Whitman? No. Lori Chestnut? No. And who did I miss? Scott Puchatsky? Aye. Five to five, Mayor. <laughs> Tiebreaker. <laughs> uh, I guess I got to ask John a question. First, John Hart, am I in conflict here? Because I own a liquor license? You don't run a grocery store, do you? No. All right. Well, then I vote aye. Yeah. Motion carried. All right. Thank you all. All right. Uh, let's move on then to uh, ordinance uh, number 0319. Uh, this is an ordinance establishing uh, fire protection charges in the city of Opaca, and this is the first reading of this. Uh, Henry, uh, I, the fire district actually asked uh, Henry to uh, put something together for this, so I'm going to turn it over to Henry. Okay, thanks, Mayor. Uh, Council, the, uh, this uh, item is on page 71. As the mayor uh, had, has said, uh, the fire district has uh, asked the cities and the surrounding towns uh, to consider adoption of this ordinance. I think the, the fire district is just, or the fire department is looking for a vehicle, no pun intended, to have uh, the ability to collect on uh, fire calls uh, in the event that it might be a transient person or somebody that's uh, maybe not a local taxpayer. Um, and in this day and age, I think probably another uh, goal of this is to try to uh, have another revenue source pot potentially to kind of help uh, with budgets. I had asked uh, uh, Attorney John Hart to look at it, and I, I think uh, 
John, if you have any points you'd like to make about it, but uh, um, so I, I, I think it's in good order. Uh, it does give them the ability uh, to collect the fee. Uh, it is would be up to a maximum of $500, and it's pretty clear that they have to justify the cost, so they'll have to look at equipment and, and the types of uh, response that they uh, make in determining the fee that they charge. So it gives them a little flexibility. I don't know if you have any questions about it? Kathy does. According to the levy limit law, this would have a reduction in our levy because right now that service is covered under our levy. So any additional fees for fire services Kathy, would be... can I stop you? Sure. Because I think we need to find out. I, I think you're basing that on your opinion, but I, I, they've already asked the Towns Association if that was okay, because that same Have question they asked came up. the Department up. of Revenue? Well, I, I don't know where the <laughs> That Towns would be are. the thing that, who, yeah. who, would, who, yeah. who would determine that. Yeah, I'm sorry. You can finish, though, but, and then I'll, I'll say something. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt um, you. I'm sorry. Because under the examples in under the levy limit facts sheet for the Department of Revenue, it states that a municipality funds its fire protection services by a tax levy and it adopts a new fee, um, um, it would need to reduce the levy by the amount of that fee that it's going to be collected. Okay. Okay. Now the difference might be because of it's the fire districts collecting that fee, but because our district is not, it's a department in essence, um, and because it does go across all the different municipalities, it may have a different caveat on this, but right now, the, my interpretation of this would be that you would have, uh, it's currently being funded with tax levy, so um, with, a, uh, with a service fee. So I, I think a, additional, um, before the next reading, you would have to make sure that the Department of Revenue understands that um, the district is, is charging that fee, and it's not. Uh, and it, it shouldn't impact ours, but. Okay. Okay. Good comments. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Henry, can you follow up Absolutely. and find out for sure on that? Any other comments about the ordinance itself? Steve. I read it over and I didn't, I wasn't sure what it was saying, but um, was it saying that not only the city, but everybody involved in this district will be charged it? All the townships will be doing the same thing as we're doing? Yeah, th this same ordinance is going to each one of the townships for their approval. I mean, they I just might. didn't want us to be yeah. sitting there alone. Yeah. Uh, they might modify it, obviously, you know. But then they'd have to come back. Or we'd have to they'd come back, come back to the fire district, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if if we all end up with, there's four, you know, there's there's four townships and then the city, so there's five of us all together. And we might end up with five different ordinances, I, you know, if, if this happens. And we're hoping not. We're hoping that everybody approves the same ordinance. It'll make it easier for yeah. actually doing the billing and stuff. Yeah, Yeah, Scott. that's my question. We do the billing as a city or as a fire district? The fire district will do the billing. Well, then I don't understand the reason for the ordinance. I guess you'd have to help me if we're not gaining, why, why do we have to have an ordinance in the city? Uh, it, there's this gray area, I guess, I don't understand. Is the fire district's gonna bill, why are we involved, I guess? I, I, what's that reason, Henry? Well, John, please pipe in. I, because uh, Kathy mentioned, they are not a statutory standalone fire district with taxing authority and everything. So they are working on the behalf of the city and the four towns, so when, when they need something of this level, then each of the jurisdictions needs to pass it to allow them to do it in our jurisdiction. Because as you know, we make an annual appropriation right. to the district like the towns. They manage the budget, the district uh, yeah. board manages all that. So we uh, kind of relinquish authority in that area. So this is sort of an operational item, I would say. I don't know, did I characterize that? Okay. All right. 
Um, so the, the big item on here really was, and I sit on the fire district um, as the mayor, um, the big the big issue, one of the big issues was the false alarms. I mean, obviously we have volunteers that are on the fire department. They have to leave work, and there's false alarms that are out there. We actually have something in our police, right, that covers false alarms. Yeah, we do. I believe it's um, after the third one, um, we do charge them for that. So they get three within a year. So I, I suppose if worse came to worse, we could... We could probably piggyback theirs. And what he's talking about is an ordinance that's in place. They just get charged with an ordinance violation, and it's collected through the courts, as like anything else. Under these circumstances, if there is, a, if there's a charge assessed, and it is on private property, and it is unpaid, it is assessed as a delinquent charge against the property and collected through the tax rolls. I believe. Uh, if it happens on a city street, if it happens on a state or county highway, the state will reimburse up to $500 for that call, but the fire district has the obligation to try to collect that back from the person who made the call, and if they collect it, they reimburse it back to the state at some point. If it's on a city street and it's not, it's in a public area and there's a fire call, the only recourse the city has is try to collect it from the person who made the call or who was responsible. And if that person doesn't pay voluntarily, they do have the opportunity to sue the person in small claims court for whatever charges there are. But that would be the only recourse they would have to collect it. And they make, a lot of those calls could go uncollected for that reason if it, if it wasn't on private property. Right. Kathy. My concern is, is if the district is doing the inventory, how do I have the authority then to put it on the tax roll other than from this ordinance? Because it's not my receivable. It's the district's receivable. It's their, they're, they're trying to collect. So I. I think as the uh, treasurer of the fire district, I think the, the fire district would be okay if you wanted to do the bill. <laughs> I, I think that's something that you'd have to work out. The fire district really doesn't have authority to enact ordinances. The fire district probably couldn't collect through a small claims because they're really not a legal entity. They're an organization of all of the towns, but really they are an organization that runs the fire department. And if there's charges that go out, I believe it would be charged by the city so that you can collect it. I would have to re-invoice right. it and right. say, here, right. yeah. I, I got billed from the fire district yeah. right. for your property. Right. Okay. Do you think we should table this? Um, it's the first reading. Okay, until we get all yeah. the facts. Yeah, absolutely. It's the first reading. So that's what we're waiting for is comments when you do the first reading. So Henry will, and you don't have to approve it at the next one. You can do, I guess we could have a first, first reading and then do a second. There is no urgency to this. There, you're right. Um, but, okay. All right, so this is the first reading of that ordinance and uh, there will obviously be further information and discussion to, to be had at a later time. Okay. Uh, ready to move on. Next is uh, license report 1442. This is just uh, one individual that's uh, requesting a taxi driver's re uh, renewal and it actually goes back to the beginning of this year because this is on a calendar year. So we would need an approval of license report number 1442. So moved. Motion by Hackett. Second. Second by Chestnut that we approve license report 1442. Discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against, motion carried. Uh, we have uh, four individuals on license report number 1444. These are always uh, pending background checks and payments of any fines owned to the city, but uh, the clerk's office is recommending that we approve those pending those. <coughs> we need a motion to so approve. Moved. Second. So, motion by Peterson, second by Fair, that we approve license report 1444. Discussion? 
All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. All right, uh, next up uh, actually is our, our issue project discussion, and this is uh, where we set aside 30 minutes uh, on an item, and uh, this is for our upcoming strategic planning and presentation, and I'll let Henry do the introductions. Um, with us this evening is uh, Walter Jankowski. I think he goes by Wally. Either one. Okay. Can we get that one on? Uh, is Josh in the back? Yeah, we'll just push a button. Yeah. <laughs> Point it. Point it at it. Okay. Yeah, uh, Walter's going to be helping us uh, with the strategic planning process over the next couple of months. And uh, he came into town a little bit earlier today and had met with the uh, department heads and some uh, division heads earlier. And uh, now is his time he wants to engage uh, with the council. And so he's going to talk a little bit about strategic planning, but he's got some homework for you or an exercise, I guess, right? Actually, I'm going to forego some of the exercises, but we are going to start with um, the first exercise is, um, how, how many of you uh, are familiar with TED Talks? Technology, entertainment, and design. They're short little 12 to 18 minutes. And there's a great TED Talk out there by uh, Simon Sinek, and he talks about start with the why. And the, uh, a major instance that he talks about is uh, the difference between like Apple computer and uh, Dell computer. Dell and uh, IBM products focus more on the what and the how and all the bells and whistles, but Apple focused on the why. So I'm going to have you guys actually do a little activity, and uh, you can get into groups of two or three. And what I want to do is ask, why plan? Why, uh, why would you want to go through this process and or what would you like to go get out of this process? Okay, uh, so get into groups of two or three. You're going to talk about why plan. Why are we going to go in planning? And uh, you, and me, you guys can do the same. Oh, okay, what would you get? Why plan? Or what would you like to get out of this process? You're going to say it. If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Okay, awesome. <laughs> That's Is that a song? I, I think so. Yeah. I think it's a poem. No. What else? Uh, self accountability and um, learning to expand the base of your ideas from the input of the other participants. Okay. Yeah. When all of you get together, it'll be more powerful and getting a common plan with all of you rather than just individuals. Good. What else? And then getting accountability. What else? Go ahead, Henry. We all need guidance. Okay, yeah, so this is going to give you kind of a pathway and a guidance of where you want to go and where you want to be, what, uh, where you want to be in three to five years or whatever that looks like. Okay? All right, um, so we went, uh, as, I, as uh, Henry said, we went, or we did an hour and a half kickoff session with the department heads tonight. And I'm going to uh, just go through a, a couple of uh, quotes here. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower said, plans are nothing, planning is everything. Uh, Benjamin Franklin said, by failing to plan, you're pl uh, planning to fail. And uh, Patton said, a good plan today is better than a, a perfect plan tomorrow. Alan Aiken said, planning is bringing the future into the present so that you can uh, do something about it now. And my favorite one. Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> so um, Henry and I have talked uh, several times, and then he's talked to the mayor about um, developing a strategic plan for the city of uh, Wapaka. Let me tell you a little bit about myself, Walter Jankowski, reinvention consultant with a, a company I own called Better Dash Faster. I'm outside of Madison, and I help senior executives do things better and faster. So I do a lot of process improvement metrics, and I do a lot of strategic planning. And my clients are uh, American Family, uh, Q to Mutual, Land's End, but I've done uh, many municipalities, uh, many uh, counties and uh, state agencies. And um, uh, at any given year, I probably have uh, 
10 to 20 plans going on at any given time. So I'm going to, uh, I, I actually, uh, before I started talking to Henry, I went out to your website, which is a really nice website, by the way, and I typed in strategic plan, and that's what I got. Nothing found. <laughs> so uh, I, I would say, uh, in because, and that's not because this is what I do, but uh, I work with lots of uh, high performance organizations, and I'll tell you, if you don't have a plan, then you don't know where you're going. So. That's what I'm gonna show you tonight is kind of the process. I was gonna walk you through some exercises, but I'm gonna shorten this up. I'm gonna, uh, we did welcome and introductions. I'm gonna just kind of go through the proposed process that we're uh, talking about. And I'll, I'll ask you a couple of questions and then I'm gonna show you some sample deliverables. Here's what we're gonna get at the end of this process. And then uh, we'll talk about next steps and timeline, okay? And you can ask questions throughout this as, as you see fit. So. The, the process that we are, are uh, have put together here, I am a big believer in, or, um, it, we're answering four questions. So, and actually the, a question I'm gonna ask you is you have citizens or potential uh, tourists or people that, uh, that you want to uh, move their business here or that you wanna attract young families or uh, whatever. They have a future set of needs. Right, and you can see that they are different. So if I'm a young family, you tell me, give me one thing that a young family, why would I move to Waupaca? What's one thing that, what's a future, what's a need that I would need for a young family coming here? School. Education. Good schools, Recreation. right? That's probably the main thing is I'm gonna look for the schools and the school districts. What else am I looking for? Recreation. Recreation, I want uh, uh, recreational th uh, things for my kids and want, and want them to be able to uh, participate in soccer and uh, et cetera. So our parks and rec person here knows what we're talking about. What else are they Job. looking for? Employment. What's that? Jobs. Jobs, yeah. Uh, I want an economy where I can uh, find a job and move up in a job. What else? Medical. Yeah, I want a good uh, medical. Okay, great. You got future needs. And they might, and uh, younger folks might also want uh, uh, Wi-Fi or um, uh, cool things to do uh, when I have babysitter, et cetera, right? You also have businesses, you also have tourists, uh, you have different groups that have future set of needs. And with Wildpacket, you have a current capability. Those You have, with your existing resources and the existing dollars that you spend, that's your current capability. And what we're gonna ask is, what are the largest gaps between those future people that you want to attract and bring to and uh, 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 Wapaka. So uh, the strategic planning is, uh, in my process, is four questions. Who are your key customers? Your lead, the ones that are existing and already here and they are the ones who uh, decide whether you are doing a good job, and then your target, the ones that you want to attract more of. And then what do they need? What are they looking for? What is it that they're, uh, uh, what are they looking for? And then what's your current capability to meet those needs? And then what are your biggest gaps? And so those four questions, you know, in, in the process, that is a lot of what we're gonna be asking about. And so let me show you kind of high level what this looks like. I'm, I've done many plans and what I am a big believer in is lots of you, all of you know a lot of the issues that uh, Wapaka is facing and so do your department heads. Um, let's get those out on the table. So the first thing that I do is I send out an online survey to all department heads. And we're asking them about 18 questions and it's basically around who are your customers, what do they need, what are the biggest gaps, um, and, so, and we'll ask them what are the planning assumptions and external factors, what are the things that we need to pay attention to in the next three to five years that are going to uh, impact the city. Second a series of questions around stakeholders and who are your key stakeholders and then what is it their needs and what are the biggest gaps that you have there. Then we'll ask some internal questions around culture, process, and measures and uh, how uh, well are you doing uh, or organizationally. And then the last is uh, open-ended questions that are uh, opportunities for improvement, things like uh, what drives you nuts? If you, um, uh, what's excessively bureaucratic that uh, you think needs to be fixed? What are the top four or five projects that we need to accomplish in the next two years? Uh, if you were king or queen for a day, what would you change about the city of Wapaka? Open-ended questions, 
department heads and key staff members answer all of those. I compile all those, it's relatively anonymous. I, it's not completely anonymous because if the police, uh, police chief uh, says something about police, you'll probably gonna know it, he said it. But I group them and put it in a, uh, I'll, I'll, in, into a, a, a packet and you'll see that. And then in the planning day, or you'll get a chance to answer online questions around that packet. And then on the planning day, we'll all together figure out our strategy, priorities, objectives, goals, action plans, and measures. Okay, that's the high level. And so phase one, we just agree on the approach and we've already kind of talked about dates and, uh, uh, and how we're gonna approach this. We're having the kickoff meeting. As I said, we met with the department heads before this. Uh, that is already done and now tonight, uh, the council, just giving you a heads up as to what this is uh, going to be. Then the online survey uh, tomorrow will go out to the department heads and they'll have uh, basically until April 15th to answer those questions, I'll compile them in that week and I'll compile those results and then you'll get a packet and it'll look something like this where you'll have, here are the responses grouped by like topic and issues that uh, people have said and then you'll see some graphs around uh, biggest gaps and uh, et cetera. And then what I'll do is I'm gonna ask you to I'm gonna have you get that packet and I'm gonna ask you, read pages three, four, and five. Tell me what are the biggest gaps there that you see from the department heads? What are they saying are the biggest gaps in the city? Now read pages five, six, and seven and tell me what the biggest gaps are there. And so you'll have an online survey. It'll take you about 60 to 90 minutes to fill that out. And then I'll combine all of the responses. And if you look back in this, in this survey, you can see the little red responses. The councils will be in red italics and the department heads will be in black. So you can kind of see who is saying what. Then we take that whole packet and we have a strategic planning advance. We uh, think you already have the date set, May 17th and 18th. Uh, it'll be a Friday. Um, uh, we are talking about bringing in the a person from the uh, veteran and her perspective is, uh, what, uh, it's veteran services or veteran? Yeah, she's the cabinet secretary for the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, awesome. Mary uh, Kohler. And uh, what we talked about is she's a really good, um, let's say customer of yours, right? You want to have more uh, and really be a partner with them because they're a big employer and they also do a really good service. In, in, and so she can give you some really good feedback around what is it that she's looking for in a partnership with the city. Then um, in that strategic planning events, uh, advance, you'll be sitting in cross-functional tables, you'll be sitting with department heads and uh, various staff, and um, it uh, will talk, we'll, I'll just have the packets in front of you and I'll say, read pages three, four, and five, you tell me the biggest gaps. Give me the top three to five things that we gotta pull forward. Then we do the next activity, then we do the next activity. And by the end of the day, you're gonna have a flip chart, each table will have a flip chart full of sticky notes and then you'll look across all of those and say, what are the common themes? And then you, each table write, will write their own strategic plan saying, here are what we think are the biggest rocks. And we, uh, every time I've done this, we have done a strategic plan in uh, anywhere from four to six hours. And we're done. At least you're done. Then we take the, uh, all, I, I take all of those back. You do a report out. I combine them all and I take a first pass at what I heard or what we, we all heard in that planning session. And then I work with the department heads to refine it and get it to be a uh, uh, city of Wapakas. And then you guys, um, they'll get, they will present a draft to you saying, here's what we did in the planning session, here's our big uh, rocks, et cetera. And then, um, and then we'll talk about execute and report out, okay? So that's the overall process. Let me show you some sample deliverables and ones that I recommend. The first one that I recommend is a one-page roadmap. So I want you to think of this as a a uh, laminated card that all city employees and council members have, and it has a high level one page summary. Uh, it's your rotary speech. Somebody says, what's going on at, at the city? And you can say, um, uh, here's their current state, here's our future state, and here's where we're going. And I'll show you an example of that. Then the second, I believe, I'm a big believer in a one page strategic plan. It's gonna be a high level, 
and then uh, we'll break it down into the detail and I'll show you uh, examples of that. So here's an example of one we, I just finished with the uh, city of Oconomowoc. This is their roadmap and you can see on the top, it's what's the marketplace realities, what's going on and what's impacting our city. Then on the left hand side is uh, what's our past or current state and then over on the right hand side, what's our future state and then they are on, on a lake and so they uh, chose the lake theme and the boats are their strategic initiatives that are taking them to from current state to future state and the buoys are their guiding principles. So that uh, that's on one side and then on the back side it is these are the guiding principles that we all that we hire by, that we evaluate performance by, that we uh, give recognition by, et cetera. So all of the staff understand where we're going and where uh, uh, and what we're doing with this and and the same with the council, okay? Then when you uh, talk about the summary plan and timeline this is their strategic plan. This is the one pager. You can see there's, uh, we have uh, provide a safe and secure community, uh, improve and maintain our infrastructure and facilities, focus on our economic development, improve our quality of life assets, and then enhance the effectiveness of our city government. You can see in each of these, this is the one page strategic plan. Each one has a staff owner, and then it has a future state. What would this look like if uh, we did this really well? And what would this look like in three to five years if we did this really well? And then underneath it are the objectives. What are you going to do in each of those areas? So that is the level that the council would be in is you're checking to make sure that they are doing what? Now what's behind that, if you take that first one, provide a safe and secure community, you can see the objectives underneath there. You take each of those objectives and then it breaks to the, to the next level of initiatives or actions or tactics and those are basically at a project level. What are you going to do and, and who's it assigned to and what quarter and what milestones are you going to have for that? And so that's how you get the accountability is each, uh, each goal will have um, uh, specific owners and, and projects associated with that, okay? And then, uh, then you have detail behind it and uh, where you, uh, once a month or once a quarter, the uh, staff is updating uh, the detailed plan and you're doing red, yellow, green uh, are, and status comments and what percent complete are we, et cetera. And then you have uh, report outs. And what you do up at, uh, ahead of the game is you lay out a one year council agenda and you say, here's, um, uh, uh, police department, you're going to report out in uh, the in the uh, June meeting and uh, Rep Park and Recs, you're going to report out in October and et cetera. And you lay out a council agenda for 12 months that basically has report outs of where we are on our strategic plan and uh, uh, what progress you're making. And then the last, we'll have a draft set of measures uh, that uh, the uh, key performance indicators for the plan. Okay. Uh, here's an example of, and now once you have the plan, I'm a big believer in developing the plans relatively the easy part. It's executing the plan and that's the hard part. And tracking it and making sure you're making progress. Uh, in uh, Oconomowoc's case, we built out a SharePoint page, which you guys have, and this is a one page uh, uh, SharePoint that has uh, the council and all staff can go out to this page. It has their uh, mission vision and their guiding principles and their plan there. But then they have uh, the strategic plan action items and by goal, it has the goals and then it has the objectives and then underneath each objective, it has the actions or the, or the um, projects, let's say, underneath it. And it, each one is, it has an assignment when it's gonna do and uh, what percent complete are they? And then once a month, staff goes in and updates it and puts their comments in and says where they're at. And once you do that, you can get a report that says, here's what uh, overall in our initiatives, uh, what percent complete are we, how many are signing in progress, by goal, by department, by whatever you want to have. And uh, so setting up a scorecard like that, now you can start seeing, are we making progress on the plan, okay? Uh, or you, there are other tools out there if you're interested, you know, Invisio has a tool that, uh, uh, is an online web tool that uh, gives access to all the uh, to all citizens, et cetera, costs money, but uh, the SharePoint is, you already have it and it's free. So 
Questions? That is the high level process. And uh, what questions do you have? I have one. Is this a typical three year scenario you do these strategic plans for? Is it two, one? Five? He, um, usually with municipalities, we think out five years, but we plan to uh, two years. Because you really, uh, you, uh, you always get hit with different things, and and uh, what you'll find is uh, something will come up, some property that you want to buy or some other initiative, and and then you'll say, um, should we do this and bump this into the plan, and and then you can adjust the plan at any, any given time. But I like to think, I like to think in 18 month blocks uh, because that seems about what people can bite off. Okay. What else? Yeah. Well, I, I, this, please debunk this if it's wrong. Um, I have the sense that a government, because we have so many services we deliver, we're pretty complicated. You know, you've worked with some nice companies, and let's say it lands in, okay? I might uh, debunk this if it's, if it's wrong. Okay, they buy goods, they've got a big warehouse, and they pump the goods out to a customer. Pretty straightforward, or a manufacturing company makes 10 widgets. We have such a diverse set of things that we do. It is really challenging for us, I think. At least that's, again, debunk it if, if I'm totally wrong here, because I, it is challenging to get your arms around everything we do in the community, and in today in our exercises, it's hard to identify customers because there's so many of them. Yeah. I, and actually, uh, what I've found with most, oops, let me see if I can get back to, um, and, and with most government entities, you'll find like, uh, oops, sorry. Let's go back to there. I, I would venture to guess that you have very similar issues. Like if, uh, so strategic goals to me are, you know, the three to seven areas that we need to make significant progress in in the next three to five years. Well, I'll tell you, it's the, uh, many of the municipalities are very similar. These guys, uh, they need to make significant progress in providing a safe and secure community. And they have specifically, you know, um, dealing with opioid uh, crisis, dealing, uh, and then improving and maintaining uh, our infrastructure. Um, Oconom, uh, Walk was dealing with um, uh, water and flooding, and uh, but they also have some aging streets and they need to do it, or they had uh, new parklands that they had to figure out how are we gonna get people access to it, uh, et cetera. Uh, focus on economic development, does that sound familiar? Um, improve our quality of life assets, yeah that big bucket, but what's gonna change, and then the last one, uh, enhance the effectiveness of our city government, what's gonna change is what uh, underneath there is most important to you guys as, as council members, and then what's important to uh, uh, the department. And you know there might be another bucket in there, but uh, you're right, with a business, you are, you know, uh, it's different issues, but it's basically you're answering the same question. Who are our customers? What do they need? What do we need to, uh, what do we need to go after and get more customers, et cetera? So, okay, uh, did that answer your question? Yeah. What else? All right, turn to a, turn to your group, and one last question: What? Did you like, dislike, or learn about this process and or any concerns that you have about this process? Uh, what I am trying to do is make this process, I'm trying to limit the amount of time that uh, and resources from department heads and from council, but what did you like, dislike, or learn about this process and or concerns? I'll give you, go to your small groups and uh, I'll give you two minutes, go. <laughs> Like, dislike, or learn about the process or concerns that you have. What do you got? Very much like the follow-up and the interactiveness that you have um, in inputting uh, how how we're getting to our goals. Good. What else? 
Yeah. Highly detailed. And uh, what we learned is that we need a planning man. <laughs> uh, as I said, the, the uh, entities that I've worked with that actually execute the plan have made um, ex vast strides. We we'll talked to anybody at the city of Oshkosh. I've done their plan for the last 10 years, and they have gone from uh, not having a plan to executing on their plan, and now they're growing by leaps and bounds. And, and it's because they just focus their staff's efforts in the ways that they wanted them to. So what else? We like the shortness of your presentation, <laughs> but, but the thoroughness of it also. Okay, awesome. And I did cut a big chunk out, so I apologize if you Thank had a handout. So, <laughs> anything else? Yeah, I was looking forward to using that clicker, quite honestly. <laughs> You'll get a chance. Uh, You'll get a chance in the planning session. You yeah. know, I, I, one thing that we, uh, that I was thinking about that council just went through is when you were talking about a plan and, and evaluating that plan, uh, we just talked about that uh, just at, at our last meeting, quite honestly, and it's very difficult to evaluate a plan when you don't even know what that plan is. Exactly. So, yeah. And it's hard to hold him accountable when you, well, okay, I think you're doing a good job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Any others? Okay, so you are going to, uh, the staff is going to get, uh, uh, and they're going to have from April, uh, from uh, tomorrow to April 15th to fill those out. Uh, I'm going to, it's going to take me about a week. I'm going to compile it. You're going to get uh, it, it'll be, it's going to be 15, 20, 25 pages of responses uh, there. And then, so I'm, as I said, I'm going to ask you, read pages two and three. What do you see? Biggest gaps. What do you, what, and then you'll have the opportunity to answer open-ended questions like, what do you think of the top five uh, projects for the city? What do you, what, what do you think is broken that drives you nuts that needs to be fixed? And, and uh, so you can start thinking about that right now. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for coming. <clears throat> and I was under my 30 minutes, all right? Yeah. <laughs> Easily. Right. Yeah. Safe travels home. Oh. Thanks, Dave. Put my sunglasses back on. All right. Okay, uh, next we have, uh, actually we're getting near the end here. We have uh, communications, recommendations of the mayor. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, Henry brought this up and, and, uh, and him and Sandy were talking about it. But we had a group of individuals, I think there was about a dozen residents that actually spent time in the downtown area and they actually cleaned up the area. And it was spearheaded, as I understand, by uh, Shad Hunley, as much as I hate to uh, 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 talk about another uh, establishment in town, he works at, we he's the manager at Weasels, and yeah, and so he was the spearhead uh, behind that, so much appreciated, uh, you know, there's, after a uh, long winter like that, there's plenty to be cleaned up, appreciate that. Um, Chuck, I thank you, uh, I know that uh, there was an election yesterday, and, and Chuck was on the on the short end, but uh, you've had many good years with us, and we really appreciate uh, having that value uh, that you bring to our to our council. So, good luck to you. Thank you, Mayor, and I appreciate everything I've learned from my fellow council people and the staff, and I hope I did help make a difference the last few years. So Absolutely. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. And also, I think all of you uh, received an email from Brennan. Uh, Brennan has decided to move on, and uh, actually his last, uh, he, he's going to keep working uh, through the 19th, I think, isn't it, Henry? Uh, maybe subject to call, but uh, Brennan, uh, good luck in, in your endeavors in the future. Thank you. Any other comments uh, for the council? Anything else? Laurie? No. Okay, we need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion by Hagen. Second. Second by Keelan. Okay. Thank to you. approve. <laughs> to adjourn. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> yeah, they're waving at me. Uh, <laughs> to adjourn to our next regular scheduled meeting, which is Tuesday, April 16th, 2019, subject to call.
All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against, motion carried. We are adjourned at 7.30 p.m. Uh, safe drive home, everybody. Uh, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.